So today we're going to be continuing looking at working with emotional intelligence and I think we're actually going to wrap up this series today. I realize that there are a few chapters left but what happens is um, kind of like what when in the beginning I said you know it's getting boring and dry and repetitive and redundant and uh, and if it keeps going that way so and then we jumped right into another chapter where things started getting good again and now the entire last part is simply a rehash of the first portions. So section four is a new model of learning and we talk about a billion dollar mistake which is simply a case study in how one particular group you know did something wrong it didn't have emotional intelligence it's starting to me to feel kind of like a kind of like a uh, like sort of a, a parable or something that um, you know, you didn't follow our perfect plan. Feels like church growth to me. You didn't follow our perfect plan and so things went bad. But if you follow our perfect plan and build emotional intelligence up, then everything's going to go great for you. That's what I feel like they're going to in this last thing. So they did the billion dollar mistake. They did a section on best practices which of course is about how to apply these different things. And really it's nothing more than antidotal stories. And then it gets into the, emotion, the emotionally intelligent organization, which is analyzing things. So let's just go ahead and do some final wrap ups. Um, of course, we, we did get a lot of good advice throughout the book. Uh, the, so the first, you know, the first sections, the middle sections was pretty good, um, where it gave us a lot of these things to think about. And if you look back over the, the previous videos in the series, we had a lot of good things to think about. We had a lot of really good, um, uh, just really good information, ways to self-evaluate ourselves into thinking about what what it might take to move on in our own personal lives. And then now we kind of take these approaches and start moving this into an organization and into a team. And this is the part where it kind of like goes back to what I said earlier. You can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make it to drink. Um, and this is one of the problems that I find with a lot of these types of books that are geared towards executive levels. They read this and go, oh, this is really great. And it is really great. If you take these things, if you apply it to yourself, uh, if you, uh, if you learn things yourself personally and you personally grow, that's a great thing. But now how do you as a manager or as a business owner take this and have your team apply these things to their life? Well, I'll submit to you that that is pretty close to impossible. It's hard to ask anybody to change for themselves. The person has got to want this type of stuff. Now, if you are following the series or you're reading the book, then you yourself are growing and moving on. And that is a great thing. And I encourage reading books like this because it will give you some things to think about. It gives you uh, thoughts and ways you can improve yourself as an individual employee. But I think once we have a manager or an owner who starts saying, we're going to have everybody read this because we're requiring it, and then you start doing all this, now we've gotten to the point where it's it starts to feel forced and any of this type of stuff when it's forced all it does is builds up pressures and problems and challenges but that being said of course their billion dollar mistake is a big insurance company not looking into um, not really looking into uh, people's emotions on their sales teams and things like this and of course the sales teams that started applying these types of things they would be a um, they would be um, become more successful and of course there is something to be said to build training programs to help people think about this that could in fact gear somebody along so it's not totally useless and then of course they move on to their next one which is best practices how do you assess an individual job figure out which uh, which portions of the job are important and which past aspects are, are individual emotional intelligence, which aspects are team emotional intelligence, how does all of that interplay work together. And those are all things we have to think about. Um, if we are running a big agency where we have teams of people, we need to be able to tell who has various degrees of intelligence one way or the other. And you have to put together teams that are compatible. There are simply some people in this world you will not be compatible with. And if you're not compatible with those people in this world, then there's not a lot you're going to do. The best you can do is just realize you have differences in opinions, get the work done that you need to get done, and then from there, take it easy, take it slow. 
of course, they're going to uh, make, make change uh, self-directed. That's one of their sections. This is that wishful thinking. It's very difficult to tell, to give a book like this to your team and go, hey, read this book. It's really good for you. And then you need to be responsible for doing this. Not all people want to. You know, to quote from the movie Office Space, you know, Peter is frustrated. He's talking to uh, Michael, I think it was, and he's like, you know, if, if, if we work really hard, we ship a couple more units, we don't get anything else, but the manager's stock goes up a quarter of a percent, but since he has so many stock options, he's making a lot more money. Your average person doesn't care about this because they're not getting, they're not getting paid any more if they go out and ship a bunch more units. They're going to do what their job is. They're not going to take a deep interest in working extra hard to greatly increase the productivity of the team to get nothing else out of it. And that's the unfortunate reality in a lot of circumstances. Now, I have been in jobs that are commission-based. And if you're a commission-based person, you better be growing yourself. You better be learning what it takes to do these things. But the reality is not all jobs are commission-based. And we can't just allow our team members to be you know, self-directed in their own personal growth to help your business along if they don't get anything else out of it. Because all that sounds to them, let me help you guys out who are business people, to them, that sounds exactly like, hey, I'm going to make you work harder so that we have a better atmosphere, but we're not going to give you anything else. This is just for the betterment of your job. Oh, you don't want to grow yourself? I remember having this conversation once just like this. I was working in restaurants to pay my way through college, and it was a particularly hard day at the restaurant. We had a particularly stupid wait staff on. They were making mistakes left and right. It was costing me extra time. I'm getting frustrated. And the guy's like, well, you don't want to grow yourself, learn new skills? I'm like, no, this is a stupid restaurant job that you're not even paying me $10 an hour so that I can pay my way through college. Yeah, I'm going to grow myself as much as I can in my other professional degree, but I'm not going to bust it for you do extra work for a restaurant bakery position. It ain't going to happen. And oh, they probably didn't like that, but you know what? It's a sad reality. And you know what? That's also an emotional intelligence skill. It's knowing where to put your time. So if you're part of a corporate team that they're wanting you to work extra hard, but they're not willing to give you anything extra for your hard work, what's the point? That's what we're talking about. And that's why I like books like this. But you're not going to, a corporate guy is not going to take a book like this and then use this and change their team. It ain't going to happen. You might frustrate the people that leave and attract the people that already have these principles. And then it becomes a chicken and egg type of question. But of course, they're talking about best practices for the workplace. You know, providing models, encourage and reinforce the positive behaviors. And that people spot that like there's no tomorrow. It's kind of funny. Um, and of course, the last section is the emotionally intelligent organization, taking the organization's pulse. Um, with this is this is useful information for ourselves, if not the whole thing. Uh, re realizing all these different things, have emotional self awareness, getting ready of the emotional and climate as it impacts performance, looking at achievement, adaptability, self control, all these types of things. And then what we want to do is look for blind spots in what we're doing. So if we have blind spots in what we're doing. Um, that's the thing. And the funny thing about blind spots, you can't always see them. You can't always see the blind spots. This is why it's so good to have mentors around you who can see your work ethic. They can see your heart. They can understand who you are. Mentors around you will help you see the things that you can't see yourself, and that is blind spots. And you have to have a good enough relationship where they can speak those things into your mind and into your heart. And that's the important part. So, um... With blind spots, if you see somebody's blind spot and you don't have a deep relationship with them, seek out a deeper relationship before you tell them about it or ask them if they're willing to receive some, some observations that you've made, things like that. These are things that can help a person grow. But also understand this, if you have identified somebody's blind spot, and even if I have a blind spot, I can't necessarily fix it just because I know about it. Sure, G.I. Joe, knowing is half the battle, you know, but... Just because I know it doesn't mean I can intrinsically fix it. There's just some parts of our personality that are, that are much like that. 
and we have to deal deeper with that. And this is kind of what Paul talks about, you know, um, the, the, you know, a love, or I'm sorry, I guess it's John, love covers a multitude of sins. What that means is, is love covers the, the little peccadilloes, those little things that are, are little annoyances to somebody else that you don't even see. That's kind of the thing. Sometimes we just need to learn to deal with those and not have to worry about changing them because I don't need to change everyone around me to be pleasant to me. Okay, I need to be as pleasant as I can be to other people. So hearing about blind spots is helpful, but it's not the end all be all to everything. Um, and then there's, you know, there's just a few other things. Here's a few things that uh, demoralize people. Um, how to lower performance. This is an interesting subheading because, of course, how to lower the performance. Like, ooh, why would we want to lower the performance? Well, this shows us we, ways and reasons why people become demoralized. So um, work overload. If somebody's overloaded in work, and this is where some of this problem is, when you come out and say, oh, well, you need to have you know more of this, more of that, more of whatever, you need to kind of, you know, work on yourself by take this book home and read it tonight. Well, what if I have plans with my family? I'm sorry, plans with my family is far more important than going home and reading a book tonight. Um, work overload. Um, lack of anonymity. So this is kind of this thing about having the ability, like um, having, having accountability um, and having the ability to do the work. So if I appoint you to do a job, I better give you the, the resources to do the job and the freedom to do the job. Um, that's what they're talking about. So basically, effectively, that's a nice story of saying don't micromanage people. Um, skimpy rewards. This is what I'm talking about. Why these types of programs rarely ever work. You take everybody out. They already have piles of work. They already feel overloaded. You send them out to some workshop to go learn about emotional intelligence. You've taken away a day of work and then you're expecting them to change their behavior to suit your model and your new pet peeve and you're not giving them anything else for it. That's why I don't necessarily care for these quite as much. Um, loss of connection, um, feel, feeling isolated on the job, the lack of ability to talk to coworkers. Uh, the lab that I went to in grad school, prior to me getting there, our PI had young kids. Of course, with young kids, you can feel more in control. Your kids listen to you, you're the parent, whatever else. Well, prior to me getting to his lab, it was a much tenser situation. Once his kids moved into teenage years, he realized that he couldn't control the entire world and our lab became a lot better. But we actually still had another lab on campus next to ours that was so authoritarian, people were not even allowed to talk to each other. I mean, it was crazy. They had one computer in the lab and it was right next to where the PI's desk was so she could see everything you were doing on that computer. That is absolute authoritarianism and people couldn't have friendships they couldn't have relationships in work you had to show up and quietly go about your work it was insane it was like a concentration camp that type of thing greatly demoralizes people and we know who those people are and didn't care for them um unfairness um inequities and in how people are treated you know oh he's treating this guy better because he's bored whatever that's the type of thing and then the last is the value conflicts. The value conflicts is the last thing. Um, if there are a mismatch between a person's principles and the demands, I told you about a friend of mine once who uh, he had to quit. He was the like the highest person there outside of the owners. He had to quit the job because his bosses wanted him to fudge the numbers to make it look better. You know, that's exactly what happened in Enron. He's like, I don't do that kind of stuff. That's not me. And so what he ended up doing is quitting the job looking at other things um, because he was not willing to compromise his morality for the job. And so a value conflicts um, will lead to lower demoralization. And in his case, he's like, it's better for me to leave. Fine. You want to get somebody in here who's going to fudge the numbers for you? You go ahead and do that. I'll tell you what, I know that organization is today. They still exist, but this is not a good place to work or live or, or be. All right. Um, and of course, they have the heart of the performance, which is, again, all the positive portions, balancing all sides, keeping you know, the commitment, the strategy, all these kinds of things. So I just kind of wanted to, to 
leave it off here. You know, it's it's interesting. It's probably good for some people, but I didn't think it was worth another four weeks of going through this book to look at that. So I'm going to look at something for outdoor philosophy next time. Maybe we'll do another book. Maybe I'll just uh, come up with some topical thing to do. You guys let me know in the comments below if there's some specific thing we can be looking at. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and figure out another topic for outdoor philosophy next time. So thanks for coming along. Have a look at the links in the description down below if you want to help support the channel, and we will catch you later.